All right, thanks for having me here. I don't know if my is mine is reflective as Joe's, but um, I do want to tell you what we're up to, and we'll take it from there. So, we are trying to extend health span using big data and novel approaches, and I think, of course, these days we do sick care rather than health care. But even when we do execute health care, if you think about it, the way we do this, is very archaic, and I think we could actually be much more transformative. So if you think about it, what do you do when you go to a physician? Well, you get in a car, usually an inconvenient time to go to a physician's office. You arrive at an office that pretty much looks the same as it's looked for the last 40 years with maybe a few new gizmos. From that, when you're there, they'll pull a very large aliquot of blood, uh, maybe make a few other measurements. At the end, they'll maybe measure 15 things or so. Uh, from that, as I say, they don't measure very much. I forgot to say that it often hurts when they take the blood. And lastly, from those measurements, we'll make a decision about your health based on population averages. And we think since everyone's different, we should really be tracking people individually and setting up individualized programs around this. And so many of you may know, a number of years ago, we set up a big data project when this is all fairly brand new, where we actually do very, very deep data dives on people, and we do it longitudinally. So we'll sequence our genome, we'll make it m many measurements of molecules, out of their blood, out of their urine, their microbiome, uh, on top of clinical, deep clinical testing, questionnaires, and uh, wearables we brought in, um, I guess, about eight, nine years ago. So one aspect is to collect deep data on people. There's a small pilot cohort. And the other aspect is to do it longitudinally, sample people every three months while they're healthy and many more times when something evil happens, like a viral infection or what have you. And I guess a little out of date, we've been running this project for almost ten, over 10 years now. Uh, I'm one of the participants, 13 years on me. And the idea is that you're taking very, very deep data dives on people, and you'll see in a minute, I'd like to be able to do this at home. Uh, and so, um, yeah, the other aspect is to do it longitudinally, as they say, and you get a much more complete picture of people's health and their health trajectories. That's the idea. And from that, then we actually did wind up, just from the first three and a half years, made a lot of different major health discoveries. Uh, almost half the people learned something pretty important about their health, all pre-symptomatically, meaning we saw someone with early lymphoma, some pre-cancers, two people with serious heart issues. And again, the idea is that with a more complete data dive on people, we'll get a better picture of the health, again, all pre-symptomatically. And so some of these we like to think were life savings. And I'd like to point out no one technology did it. Sometimes it's genome sequencing, sometimes molecular measurements, often imaging, and what have you. The other thing we get from this is if we profile people longitudinally, we actually get to see how they age. And it turns out, of course, everybody's aging differently. So we like to think of this as you're, you're like a car. You know, your car gets older on the whole, but some parts wear out faster than others. And just some examples here, person two is a cardio ager. Their cardiac pathways are actually accelerating the most. Uh, I'm actually person one. Uh, I have a variety of things happening, pretty typical. Coagulation, metabolic pathways go up over time. And we call these age types, so we can classify people into different age types and see how they are, in fact, aging. Um, what we're trying to do these days the most is actually bring healthcare into the home. Now, I don't think all aspects of healthcare, we won't be doing whole body MRIs at home, but we will do a lot of health measurements at home. And so there's two big areas we've been pushing. One is the wearables and the other is this microsampling that we published recently. So with wearables, the idea is that you would be wearing, you know, monitors. Imagine this crowd, how many are wearing a smartwatch or a ring? That's it? Wow, what a surprise. Either you're not listening or not. Well, maybe that's my question. Shouldn't you all be wearing one of these things? All right. So we think they're pretty powerful because they track you 24-7. You get individualized baselines and you see shifts. And one of the things we learned early is that you can detect infectious disease pre-symptomatically, actually first with Lyme disease and respiratory viral infections. We can pick this up. And then more recently with COVID. We can tell when you're getting COVID retrospectively four days in real time, three days prior to symptom onset, 80% of the time. So we have a real time detection system, it works. Actually where you're resting heart rate, that's the main signal. I think other signals will be better for discriminating signal types, but basically we can see when you're getting COVID 80% of the time pre-symptomatically um, and this alerting system will 
tell you that. It gives you red alerts when that's going on. Now, I should point out it's not specific for COVID. Workplace stress is actually the number one trigger of red alerts. So it comes back to mental health. And I actually think that's valuable too. You could actually mitigate that, see who's stressing you and possibly schedule them at the right time. So um, anyway, the other area that we're pushing hard on is this microsampling. Now, I know what this sounds like, but this does work actually. So the idea is that you do little pricks. We take fixed aliquots of blood, 10 microliters for those who follow the sort of thing. Uh, you mail it overnight to our lab, and then we do these deep omics profiles, these molecular measurements, and actually very targeted assays. Uh, and so we can follow about 2,200 analytes, and most of them are stable uh, over storage time, over temperatures, what have you. So it actually is pretty robust. Not all, some of them go, do go off, and we follow those. Um, and so with this, you can do all kinds of fun things. And here's one example. We had 32 people drink this Insure Shake that you can buy in CVS. Doesn't taste very good, but we profiled them before and after they drank the shake. And it turns out everybody responded differently. So uh, each box is a different person. This is just lo looking at three carbs. They tend to behave the same as a class. But you'll notice up here, this individual, 13, their carbs plummet after drinking the shake. Go over here, this person skyrockets, skyrockets, skyrocket, goes down, goes down. Different people behave differently to the exact same shake. Then we can look at all this, so this is complicated, but the gray is an average of the group. This person here, their inflammatory markers, this group I should say, plummets after they drink the shake. This person skyrockets, meaning that shake is pro-inflammatory. People are reacting very, very differently to foods. That's been shown for fibers. Now we're showing it for a simple common mixture. That person's goes up. So if you think about 10% of people having inflammatory bowel syndrome, which is an inflammatory response, we could actually measure that in real time. Yes? Have you shown that the antioxidants in blueberries and strawberries cancel out the increased oxidative stress from the blood sugar spike that follows their consumption? Great question, no. We want to do that, yes. This is brand new data, so we're very into what mitigates glucose spikes, so things like, uh, I wear a continuous glucose monitor, you may have noticed I have four smartwatches here. So we're totally into this. So, um, but I think that's gonna be fun. That's what you wanna do, mitigate your personal things that will inflame you, so to speak. I would say anti-inflammatory as well as antioxidants. We have uh -oh. one minute for the presentation, so do you prefer to do yeah, questions within might be, it? Or? Do you mind waiting for a couple of minutes and then I think maybe I'll clarify. So anyway, I think these personal food responses we can now measure, which again is never done. Um, this is what you can do when you really combine a lot of data. So this is one person where wearing a CGM, continuous glucose monitor, smartwatch, that's the top rows there. And then we do this microsampling every hour for every waking hour for seven days. We can follow in extreme detail what's going on for every biochemical and physiological response for this person they exercise, they do all kinds of things. And then we could do what's called time lag correlations to see what's associated with what. And causative events should be upstream of downstream events. So, and we wind up making literally thousands of associations. It's super cool. I can't show them all. Some are brand new, some are known. Um, and here's a fun one, thinking about aging. So I grabbed a fun example. This is a molecule associated with Parkinson's, alpha-synuclein. We can actually track that in an individual path and we can follow it relative to this person's activity and other things. Turns out it correlates with glucose, kind of interesting. So this is the kind of thing, so I think we can set up personalized patterns inexpensively with wearables, kind of expensively with the microsampling, but I think as we get better and better at this, it'll get cheaper and cheaper. People ask me how you're gonna scale it. Silicon Valley, so you form companies. So we form companies around all these kinds of projects to try and get them out there at scale. And the microsampling ones are yellow up there, which measures metabolic health, rhythms along COVID company that uses microsampling, so on and so forth. There's a, metabo a CGM company, January AI, and that's what they sell. And then here's my team that works on this. So now I'll take questions. I think I nailed it seven minutes. Yeah, Good. awesome. Thank you so much. I don't so know where much. to start. Do you want me to do it? You want to do it? Uh, I will start maybe in the back here, right. and then we'll move on over. Fantastic presentation, thank you. I'm curious uh, for the uh, unstrapped in, can you give us your three favorite wearables? A uh, smartwatch is very inexpensive. I would say favorite though would be a continuous glucose monitor. 9% of US is diabetic, 33% pre-diabetic, and those numbers are going way up. It's worse than COVID. 
And so I actually think if you see your glucose spikes, you will change your eating behavior. Pretty much guaranteed. Very eye-opening. And you don't need to wear it all the time. I think after you wear yeah, it for a little while, you then like, I wear mine for eight years, but that's not, yeah. Yeah. OK, we have another one. Which here, CGM do you use? Uh, I use Dexcom a lot for our studies because it's blinded, but the most popular one is Abbott's little patch right there. Can't show you very well, but um, it's there. Um, if the biosensor technology was available, would you prefer a continuous, like, implantable device monitoring, or is there any, like, inherent advantage of this microsampling approach? Uh, oh, I'd rather have an implantable myself, but that may not be for everyone who worries that somebody's going to track them from above and that sort of thing. But um, <laughs> that's not so that's privacy. Yeah, that's what I meant by that, yeah. But I, they're more convenient. You know, I think they should be on kids because every parent, I don't know how many of your parents, every kid has been in a position where they've been in a store, the kid's right next to them, they turn around 30 seconds later, where'd my kid go? If I had that implantable, I'd know exactly on my iPhone. Oh, they're all the Nile 3. <laughs> so that's, yeah. Uh, do uh, the average, averages of glucose over time for sure matter for health. Do the short-term spikes matter? They're associated with cardiovascular disease. So the assumption is yes. And they seem to be a precursor. I'm a pretty good example that when things are heading to uh, gestational diabetes is a good example that people are, you know, you get your glucose dysregulated early or at a stress time and then later it becomes more severe. A lot of gestational diabetics Dang. become diabetic. Oh. Sorry, Dave. Oh, just real quick, yeah, I was wondering if the data sets are available to be licensed by other companies. Because you've got like- Our data is 100%, well, 85% of participants have made their data, including their genome sequences, totally open. So you guys can get access to all this data, CGM, wearable, et cetera, for free. Uh, She's managing. Uh, yeah. so. Have you <laughs> tested unusually slow agers, especially those from the Calorie Restriction Society? Or